Welcome to Firm Foundation. In these times of shifting standards and faulty foundations, there is a solid place on which to build a victorious life. And that place is the Firm Foundation of Jesus Christ and the Word of God. Your host for Firm Foundation is Brian Hudson, a Bible teacher, pastor, author, and producer of Life Enriching Media. We're going to today, here on the first Sunday of this new year, bring a message series, the first of a series of three messages dealing with Recover All. We're going to talk about Closure, Clarity, Covenant, Recover All. Say Closure, closure. Clarity, clarity, Covenant, covenant. Recover, recover, all. recover All. Amen. And there's a lot in here. I'm going to watch my time. I'm going to give you as much as I can on today and leave the rest for next time. I want to ask you to pay attention. You know how it is? Sometimes our minds and our circumstances try to deprive us of our attention. And that sometimes we'll get distracted and walk away or move away or answer the phone or, or do something. And we'll miss something of what God said. But there's a voice behind the voice. And always with anybody ministering in this church, any church, there's a voice behind the voice. And if you make the mistake of trying to, you know, of missing out on the voice, you also miss the voice behind the voice. So it's important to pay attention. I'm going to ask you to lock in like you were driving a car on the highway. You don't look away when you're driving. You don't look around and reach for stuff when you're driving. So let's do this like we're driving today because we're going to roll with Jesus on this morning. Amen? We're going to go to first scripture is 1 Samuel 30. And we'll read this text. We're going to preach from this text mostly next week. But this is a foundational text. And let's go into this right now. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and attacked Ziklag and burned it to fire, burned it with fire. And had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city. There it was, burned with fire. And their wives and sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were there lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. Verse 6, now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons, for his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abathar the priest, Abimelech's son, bring, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And the answer to him said, Pursue, for you shall overtake them, and without fail, recover all. Somebody say, Recover all. This is a marvelous story. There's so many lessons in this text. We'll take three weeks to open all this up. But you understand the context that we're looking at a narrative of a story in which David's people were attacked by the Amalekites. And notice that they were taken captive but not killed. But David didn't know that. David and the men that came back did not know that their families who had been taken captive were not butchered or killed. And so the distress of that moment was overwhelming. So strong to the Bible says they wept till they had no more power to weep. You ever been there before? I have. You can't weep no more. No more tears are coming out. And it's heaving. I mean, that kind of grief over a sense of loss. And I want you to realize that here on uh, the first Sunday of this year, We've looked at a year of 2020 that has been overwhelming in many ways. There's been loss. There's been heartbreak. Let's read also John chapter 15, the words of Jesus. Jesus said, 
Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Please note, he did not say, you can ask what you desire and it shall be done for you unless there's a pandemic. It's not what he said. Jesus knew full well these words would be heard and read by people in the midst of all manner of circumstances. And that we don't dismiss anything that's real. We don't believe in that. But nor do we focus on things to the extent that we miss hearing God or miss experiencing what the word says. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. And so today we're going to explore this topic of closure, clarity, covenant, recover all. On the first Sunday of this year, of every new year, the Lord gives me a word to share with our church family, with all who, are, who have ears to hear. And it's not, it's a vision, we say a vision for the year. Obviously, we can't say anything definitive about a whole year. But it's a direction we're giving at the beginning of this year that will carry you through this year, I believe. And so we're going to talk about, again, closure and clarity and covenant and how we can recover all. Now, these words, these words, closure, clarity, recover, you have your definitions in your mind. I'm asking you to suspend what you think about these words right now. Let me teach. Let me preach. Uh, don't hear a word and make up your mind what the word is. Of course you know what the word is, but let me give you perspective on these words from Scripture on today. This story of David's recovery following the attack of the Amalekites is a narrative for our times. And we're also going to keep our hearts and minds on what Jesus said. So while we look at Scripture, Scripture was given for us not just to read and say amen, but to apply to our lives. And so the story in, in 1 Samuel has application to our times. You'll see that as we go through it. So Jesus made promises. He keeps his promises. All we got to do is just lock into him. Just stay close to Jesus. Amen. Say, I'll stay, I'll stay close to Jesus. Now listen, most attacks and setbacks cannot be anticipated. Again, most attacks and setbacks cannot be anticipated. The Amalekites and today's enemies like COVID, don't come always to destroy everything, but to enslave, to discourage, and to take away our resources. Now, again, the Amalekites, in this instance, did not kill anybody. Now, now COVID has killed people. We know that. But circumstances don't always come to kill. Sometimes, most times, the circumstances come, or the fear of it comes, to distract you, to enslave you, and to drain your resources. We've seen that happen in this COVID pandemic. We're going to draw many lessons and encouragement from this story in 1 Samuel. And again, I'll look more specifically at the text on next week. Now, I want to, uh, today, I want to read to you this statement. This is from an organization called Chabad. It is a Jewish organization, Orthodox, Hasidic Jewish organization. It's a website about Jewish history. So, it's kind of, it, it makes sense, you know, if you're going to read about Hebrew history, uh, what the Hebrews got to say about their history, right? Listen, like, I hear today race conversations, ain't no black people in there. You can't have a race conversation without black folk leading it. I said leading it, amen? But this statement here says, the Amalekites, descendants of Amalek, were an ancient biblical nation near, living near the land of Canaan. They were the first nation to attack the Jewish people after the exodus from Egypt. And they were seen as the archetypal um, enemy of the Jews. The nation of Amalek is long gone, but they live on in the internal enemies that, each, that we each battle on a daily basis. Interesting, isn't it? So that 
the Amalekites were the first enemies of Israel. But they were an archetype, meaning that they were, they were a symbol of how there's always an enemy attacking God's people and God's purposes. There's always something that is attaching itself to, a, to a God's people to attack them. Now, the Bible says, we know in New Testament terms, the world, the flesh, and the devil are our enemies. And if you will, it's almost as if there's a spirit of Amalek still present. Of course, the nation is gone, the people are long gone, but as this Hebrew writer has said, that it represents, uh, the Amalekites represent that, that inner attack, that circumstantial attack that's always present in our lives. Now listen, Jesus defeated the world, the flesh, and the devil. We got the victory, but all this stuff keeps coming our way. As long as we're in the earth, we have to keep dealing with temptations and satanic stuff and, the, and wicked people, but we have the victory. We operate from a position of victory. Even when you're under attack, you already have victory. <laughs> Say this, when I'm under attack, I've already got the victory. So what you're doing is you're enforcing the victory. You're just making it clear what you have because the enemy doesn't ever give up trying to discourage you, distract you, or drain your resources. So thank God for Jesus, our Savior, our Savior. We are saved, we're being saved, and shall be saved. And yet that status doesn't prevent the enemy from attacking us. COVID came to every nation of the world. COVID's attacked everybody, Christian, non-Christian, have been subject to COVID. Now, most of us have done our best to stay clear of it, to do safe and best practices, and have avoided it. Some have not been as, as successful for various reasons. The point is, the enemy is always there. The spirit of Amalek is always with us, but Jesus is Lord. Amen? Say, Jesus is Lord. Now, there are always forces that try to resist your progress. That's my point. I'm, I'm calling it the spirit of Amalek. There are always forces, and those forces manifest in circumstances, in viruses, in people, in systems, systemic issues. Those are always forces in this world that resist your progress. And this is why we abide in Jesus and allow his words to abide in us. As we examine the story of how David, the process by which David recovered all, we're going to understand that one of the keys, one of the key, key parts of the process, and our first word in this series is the word closure. Say closure. closure. Now, again, you, I know you think you know what closure means. You know what it means. I want to give you a perspective on closure. Because as we left the year 2020, then we have to have closure to fully enter 2021. Because you don't want to live in 2021 with 2020 baggage all in your hands, all in your shoulders, all in your mind. It's important to gain closure. Let's define these words. Closure is coming to terms with what something is or what it was for the purpose of being able to move forward. That's the context I'm giving closure. Coming to terms with what is or what was so that you can go forward. So David had closure and could move forward when he did not let his grief prevent him from seeking the Lord and hearing the word. Pursue. Listen, when David was grieving and the men were all, listen, the grief was so bad, it, it was so much pain in the people and the men, they thought of stoning David. They didn't hate David, but pain makes people lash out. Hurt people hurt people. And so that's why you have to settle it and come have closure with your pain. Otherwise, you're going to try to hurt somebody or think about hurting somebody. And worse, the people you love the most are the ones who are the first ones who bear the brunt of our pain and lack of closure. So then what happened, we find that David, he was grieving, he wept, 
But at some point he said David encouraged himself in the Lord. He stopped crying. David stopped crying. He stopped grieving and said to the priest, bring me the ephod. The ephod was the, was the article used as a symbol of seeking God, a priestly item. David was a priest as well as a prophet and a king. And so David sought the Lord. How many times, how many times have we let circumstances prevent us from seeking God? We, we're grieving and crying. Now, grieving is real. We don't tell you not to grieve. But there comes a time we got to put aside that grief and get some closure. And the closure David got was he went to God in prayer because, listen, the circumstance was his, his the city was burned, the families were, were taken captive, and that was coming to terms with what is. The people were gone. And they won't suddenly appear if you keep grieving about it. So then they decided... All right, we're going to seek, the, well, David said, we're going to seek God. So he sought the Lord and said, Lord, should we pursue? And the word was clear. God said, pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. That's a very important point uh, about the need for closure. Closure is not wrapping everything up to our satisfaction. Closure is not making sense of everything. Closure is that we come to terms with what is, what was. Some people, some of us, I'll tell you, I've been there for a minute where we just don't come to terms. I, it, it, I can't believe it's happened. It happened. I miss, I miss my mother. Still miss her. It happened. You need to let God help you. The same God that we know and say we love, we do love him, Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, grief and difficulty and challenge and COVID want to crowd out the word of God. Amen. The circumstance, the enemy, the Amalek spirit wants to put the news in your mind every day. Have you locked on? You're going to watch every channel, read every news item. I read news every day. But what's the point of reading the same thing, the same thing over and over again? Amen. Amen. What that does, it crowds out the opportunity to get God's word in your heart and to get closure. Say closure. closure. Now, the second word we're dealing with here is the word recovery. Recovery is defined as return to a normal state of health, mind, and strength. It also means, this is more common to us, the action or process of regaining possession or control of something stolen or lost. I'm going to suggest to you that in our view of recovery, you cannot re regain possession of someone who passed off the scene. But you can regain recovery of your peace of mind. Amen. You can have recovery in your, in your joy. Amen? Amen? And so, see, so, so closure, recovery, go, they go together. You can't have one without the other. And this is what David found out. So when David got to closure, recovery followed. Now, in his case, recovery did mean getting, did mean getting back the family, getting back everybody. But in our context, recovery doesn't always mean you get stuff back that's gone. Because let's face it, that's not even possible in some situations. So we have to move forward, say move forward, and closure helps you do that. So then... This year, 2021, is a year of recovery. Say that. Say 2021 is a year of recovery. Make it personal. Say 2021 is my year of recovery. And which was saying return to a normal state of health, mind, and strength. And regain possession of those things that are spiritual and mental and emotional and purpose that were lost last year. Regain possession of your passion, of your mission, of your dreams, amen, of your purpose. Because, again, the, Amaleks, the uh, Amalekites come not just to kill, but to, but to take away what you, your encouragement and disturb your peace and uh, to bring grief in your life. So then, 
This is a year of recovery, and a new year represents an opportunity. And the word kairos, we learned, represents the word time in the Bible. There's chronos and kairos. Chronos is time of day, clock time. Kairos is the opportunity, the set time. So the Bible says redeem the time because the days of evil. Redeem the time means that's kairos. Or make the most of every opportunity. And you cannot make the most of an opportunity if you don't have a sense of closure. Because closure, that's what it means, close the door. So you can't go through, the other, through this new door without closing the old door. You can't hang on to two things. You can't say, well, I want this in the past. I'm going to hang on to my hurt and pain. But Lord, take me through the new door. No, you can't do that. You got to close one to open the other. Amen, somebody? See, Lord, help me close the old doors. Now, listen, closing the door doesn't mean you forget. You forget the people you miss and the people you love. It doesn't mean that at all. Not at all. It's that, in fact, I believe, it's, I believe they would tell you go forward. They would, <laughs> the loved ones who pass would tell you, man, I need you to go forward. If they can tell you that, I need you to gain closure and go forward with your life. So 2020 was one of the most unusual and abnormal years of our lives, if not the most unusual and abnormal year of our lives. It was a year of delay, a year of separation, a year of setback. But 2021 is a year of recovery. Now listen, to be sure, everything that was present on the last day of the last year is still with us on the first day of the first of the next year. You follow me? But a new year represents an opportunity, a kairos season to make adjustments in our spirituality, our mentality, and, in, and practically. So the, on, on one, in one level, it's one day to another. But because everything's marked by a year, I was born in a certain year, I got married in a certain year, you know, someone died. So we, we mark a new year as an opportunity. Say opportunity. That's why we, we talk about making resolutions and, and all that. Well, don't do resolution. Do Jesus. Amen. Do Jesus. You know, listen, a resolution will pull you right out of the spirit into the flesh. Straight out the spirit into the flesh. Because your resolution is your strength. It's your resolution. So it's going to be your strength in about 25 days, 10, two days, it's going to fall apart. So put your trust in Jesus, amen. He'll carry you through. I do make decisions. Make, make quality decisions. And the first of which is purpose to live in recovery. So I'm, going to be, I'm going to have I mean, a closure. Have closure. Close, close the old year. Close it out fully. You know, we... Accountants close the books on fiscal years, right? Yeah. And you want to balance things out so they make sense when you go back and look at it. So it's important to close out 2020. Now, we might first think of recovery as getting back things that were stolen or lost. Uh, this was the case in the story of David at Ziklag. But we're not going to focus on that definition. Again, we're going to focus on returning to our normal state of health, mind, and strength. That's our focus. And that requires, again, closure. Now, 2020 was a year of learning, adapting, and growing. Amen, somebody? 2020 was a year of learning, adapting, and growing. And that learning and growth was not so much voluntary. <laughs> you didn't choose to learn, adapt, and grow. It was forced upon us. And thank God we found grace to make those changes, didn't we? And 2020 also revealed the state of foundations in our lives. So if we were not people of prayer before the pandemic hit, you, you, you weren't better when, they, when the pandemic hit. Uh, people think that, you know, people, tragedies happen, people go to church. But going to church don't help you. If you're not going to church to be the church, to to. Uh, connect with Jesus Christ and grow with him. 
So learning and growing we've experienced was not voluntary, but it was part of God's plan for us. Even through the midst of the circumstance, it's always God's plan for us to learn, adapt, and grow. You believe that? And also we found in 2020, we've, we've seen areas of need for repair and change. We realize some things need to be repaired in our lives and or changed. But here's the good news. So now, 2021 will be a year of putting all that learning, adapting and growing into full and fruitful use. You believe that? Amen. Please receive that. That we didn't go through all this stuff for nothing. Amen? Amen. It's a year of putting what we've learned into action. Now let me say a word about my wife. Um, for the first half of last year, I watched my wife learn to do things that she hadn't done before. I mean, I learned, I watched my wife um, use her school-issued Windows laptop computer to do things I can't do myself. But it was so different even to me because they were, educators were into a whole new level of online learning and and adopting new tools and adapting. They were all adapting, right, to, to teaching online. And I watched her learn that, master that. I mean, she's mastered it. It's amazing. And here's how good, how good she's become. That they're using Microsoft Teams for classroom instruction. Why is that good? Because Teams wasn't made for that. <laughs> Google Classroom. Use that. They chose Teams, a corporate tool. The point is, she made it work. They all made it work. And they gave the kids iPads, five-year-olds with iPads. You just prop them up, lay them on the table. You see the ceiling, you know, whatever. It, you know, no, give them Chromebooks. They got the wrong software, the wrong hardware. But somehow, my wife has made... This whole thing works. She's educating, not optimally, but she's educating her children. I mean, those who are, who are with her are learning a lot, but those who don't have support by the parents, they're just, you know, not being helped. The point is, I've watched my wife adapt, learn, and grow as an educator. And it's been difficult. It's been very, very tough because, you know, educators want to be with the students. Education is about nurture. It's more than just information transfer. And so I watched her. So my point is, I've seen God in the first half of last year that I've seen her make that change. I've seen her grow in that way from being overwhelmed by it to literally knowing more than I know. I'm a tech guy. I have a Windows machine in my Mac. I got one in there. I got Windows in the Mac. The point is, but she's doing, I, I can't even, I can imagine how I look sometimes when I'm doing stuff. And she see me doing editing and all these windows, and it's like, what are you doing? And I look at her, and I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> that's, how, that's how much she has grown. And so then I think about the fact that many of us, with my wife and I, are the times of our careers where we were moving toward a stage of slowing down and, and stuff being stable and not changing and keeping the same pace and holding that pattern you know, for another two, three years to retire. Oh, no. 2020 changed all that. And I tell you, it was part of God's plan. Because even when you retire, God's not through with you. So the, so the mode of learning, the mode of adapting, the mode of growing, it never changes. It never changes. My wife, as you may know also, she had to, in the midst of the pandemic had to actually leave the school where she was teaching because the building was given away to a charter school, had to, had to leave her students without even saying goodbye. I mean, spring break happened, and no one came back. So she, didn't see her, she saw some kids online, but couldn't even say goodbye to her students. That's a serious thing. If you connect with the students a whole several months, and then you don't see them no more, that's heavy. That happened. Then, of course, going to a whole new school. And then learning a whole new culture and adapting there. My point is, this, this, this season we've been in, it's been some serious challenges to how we operate, how we live, how we think, how we feel. have all been impacted by the pandemic and by the circumstances 
of this, of this new year. And so understand that, go back to our title slide here, again, 2021, we're talking about closure and clarity and covenant. That's what we want to achieve, and we have those promises in God's word. Now, with all the heartbreaking stories about the pandemic, then we're dealing with other problems. We're dealing with, again, losing loved ones to COVID. We're dealing with the whole debacle of our national leadership in denying, minimizing, and mismanaging the impacts of coronavirus, which has contributed to misery and death. That's happened. Then we come to the murder of George Floyd that represented something that's been going on for a long time. As Will Smith said, racism isn't getting worse, it's getting filmed. So things that we didn't hear a lot about, we heard something about, saw some clips, that particular footage of that injustice in murdering George Floyd by the police officer, it, 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 it changed everything because it was so brutal and it lasted so long and was so unnecessary. And so, so, but listen, before George Floyd, here's some names. There was Philando Castile, Michael Brown, Terrence Crutcher, Eric Garner, put the names up, Alton Sterling, Oscar Grant, Freddie Gray, Botham Jean, uh, Anatia Jefferson, Betty Jones, Trevon Martin, Laquan McDonald, Tamir Rice, Ahmed Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, Richard Brooks, Jacob Blake, and unnamed people made in God's image. Just a sampling, okay, of this black folk. And, and so then we, we're in a season where, so after all that, now we're looking at the situation where people are showing disrespect. So here someone says, in light of all this brutality, someone says black lives matter, and someone says, no, it doesn't. All lives matter. And then, so then we got that disrespect going on when people realize we're not talking about the organization, we're talking about people. Capital B, small L, small M, Black Lives Matter. So then why would that be a problem for people? Because there's, there's a problem in the nation that's become manifest. It's a systemic racism. It's real. It's not imaginary. It's been real since the nation was founded when 55 of the framers of them, 25 owned slaves. 26 owned slaves, and 16 dependent on slave labor. When you start like that, you're going to go like that. You know? For, now, it's gotten better, quote, better, but better is not enough. Amen. Better, in fact, is an enemy of best. Amen? Amen? We expect a lot from our great nation. In September of last year, as Hurricane Sally tracked toward Mississippi and Louisiana, prayers went out for the people of those states. No one said all states matter. Because of the hurricane, at that time, Mississippi and Louisiana mattered. Pray for them in pre-position supplies. You can, we can focus on things, focus on the police. We can focus on people. We can do more than one thing at one time. And don't cop out saying all lives matter, especially as a response to no, not black lives, all lives. You see, you know you're talking to a racist when someone says they, they respond to you by saying I mean, all lives matter, not just black lives. We know all lives matter. Amen. But we're talking about which house is on fire right now. Amen. We're talking about where the hurricane fixing the land. These are, not, these are issues of which God is concerned. We believe in biblical justice. I wrote a book entitled Biblical and social justice, what is it? This is not something, it's not just a social thing, it's a kingdom of God thing because God cares about people. So understand that. All right, Isaiah 1, 17. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Are you doing that? Are you doing that? See? If you're not doing that, don't comment about don't say black lives matter because if you're not doing justice, then don't just shut your mouth. Then it says in Micah, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, do justice, 
to love mercy and walk humbly before your God. That's what the Bible said. Many places, I mean, there's lots of scriptures about justice, Old New Testament. So it's saying to us that in this season of recovery, we're also become, uh, gaining closure on how to handle some of these circumstances that are facing our culture today. On the matter I just mentioned about Black Lives Matter, here's how you handle it. When someone say, don't say Black Lives Matter, say it louder. Say it back to them. Because understand what the spirit of Amalek wants to do to you. That spirit wants to control you, wants to shut you down, to make you content with less than ideal conditions, to make you settle for less than what God has for you. And so it's always an appropriate opportunity to stand up and to speak the truth in love. So again, closure is coming to terms with what is and what was. And coming to terms with it doesn't mean go along with it. It means if you are called to do so, that you speak up and you defend the, widow, the widows, the fatherless. You, you speak against that which is trying to hurt your family. Defend your family. Defend your honor because it's, it's God's will. You believe that? Amen. Now, again, this culture is adamant on maintaining control. Now, here's one of the points. Closure is about settling issues. Say, settling issues. Now again, another loaded word, settle. All right, closure, recovery, settle. Again, in our minds, we have our working definition of settle. I know we do. But settle does not mean figuring everything out or resolving something to your satisfaction. You know why? <laughs> you can never fully satisfy yourself or others. See, I can never fully satisfy myself and others. You need to settle on a plan of action and make a decision. That's the biggest part of closure. Please hear that. So then people don't have closure because they won't understand the, the way it is or was, and then they won't settle the issue, meaning, meaning to, uh, to adopt a plan to let God help you adopt a plan to deal with it as it is. So it's settled when God gives you a word. So that's why when, when David was distressed, the men were distressed, thought about stoning him, when David sought God, God said, go back and cover all, then David had closure and he was settled. And so what happened after that? He got the victory. We want victory without closure, without settling, with a plan of action from God. We want stuff to happen just magically. It's called magical thinking. And Christians are prone to that. We're people of faith. We walk by faith. But sometimes it ain't faith. It's just foolishness. It's presumption. Real faith is based on God's word and God's promise. So settle on a plan and make a decision. That's the biggest part of closure. People got bad information. You cannot make a good decision with bad information. And God's word is the best information and the sources of truth. Biblical truth, historic truth, objective truth are all necessary to make those good decisions. Amen, somebody? Now, the things that people don't want you to say is often a clear indication of what you should be saying. This thing of silence in the face of injustice, people love to go quiet, you know, when things get tough and difficult, they just don't, they, they stop saying anything. And that's not, I understand the, the need we all have to just, I don't want no more to do it. I'm tired of all this. I'm tired of hearing about this. I'm just sick of it. Uh, I get that. But as long as it's in front of you, you can't be sick of it. As long as it, it, as it affects someone in your life, you can't be sick of hearing things that are affecting people, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't see no more hungry kids on TV. Well, look at them. They're hungry. Do something about it. I mean, we got to stop closing our ears and eyes to things and think somehow I'll feel better as a result. You might feel better, but you're going to mess around and disobey God. And, and, and you're going to restrict having a hinder closure in your own life. 
Listen, y'all, if I can't help bring closure to somebody else's life, if I can't sow some closure, how can I reap closure and being settled and recovering all? So again, this spirit of Amalek, as I'm calling it, is not your friend. Amalek is always your enemy. God's a God of justice, and justice equals righteousness. Closure does not require disclosure. There is knowledge that you don't need to know. Now, this is tough for a lot of us who are analytical, but there's, there's things that you having closure doesn't mean I got to know what he said and what he thought and what they said. No, you don't need that. No, you don't. No, no, you don't. You think you do. You don't need disclosure. <laughs> you need to trust God and forgive. Forgiveness is amazing. Forgiveness will stop your mind from running everywhere after somebody. Closure does not require disclosure, and there is knowledge that you don't need to know. Let me give you an example of that. Joseph didn't understand why his brothers sold him into slavery, but he had closure. Genesis 45 says this. Now, this is, this is 22 years later. All right, so Joseph was sold into slavery, went through all those trials in Egypt with Potiphar's house and, and, and the baker and all them people who mistreated him until he rose to the top, became essentially the prince of Egypt. And, and, and so, but early on, he was distressed and heartbroken. Why did they do this to me? I just shared my dream with him. You know. But then when he revealed himself to them, after the famine came and encompassed his homeland, and they all came down to Egypt. Then Joseph revealed himself and said to him, to them, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. <laughs> In other words, I ain't mad at you. Don't be mad at me. Y'all did this to me. Don't be mad at yourself. He says, for God sent me before you to preserve life. Now, what if Joseph just had to know what's going on? All the time he was in, in, in the pit, in a part of his house. I mean, if he didn't have, have resolve and, and have closure, he could have never gotten to a place of risen in the ranks in Egypt to be in position to save his family 22 years later. So, again, the previous point I'm making to you is closure does not require disclosure. Listen, y'all, listen, listen. If you put your mind in this, in this thing, you're going to mess it all up. You put your mind in here and your thoughts and your reasoning, you're going to mess up the plan. We'll mess it up, putting our mind into it, trying to figure it all out. There is knowledge you don't need to know. Say there is knowledge I don't need to know. Another example, almost done here. Mary and Joseph didn't fully understand what God was doing. Mary pondered many things, the Bible says. So here's, here's Joseph and Mary engaged, essentially married before sex, they were. And, and so here Mary come up pregnant. And Joseph be like, what's this? Who you been with, right? And he thought about putting her away. The Bible says that. But he had closure. His closure was he trusted God and continue to love his wife, and then believe what was told to her. So then the Bible says in Luke 129, Gabriel came, spoke to her, and Mary was greatly troubled at his words. She's troubled. But then, watch this, her closure was to trust God. Luke 138 says, she said, I am the Lord's servant. He told, uh, she told Gabriel, may your word to me be fulfilled. So even without understanding what was going on, got it? She said, I'm your servant, Lord. When you're God's servant, that'll cancel all the arguments in your mind. All the arguments against people and about people, it all goes away. When you're God's servant, doing God's will, and you know you're doing God's will, staying close to God, 
You don't have to know. I have to trust. And Lord, may your word to me be fulfilled. Now that was Mary's closure. And you don't get closure without seeking the Lord. And you need closure, so seek the Lord. And we don't want to carry the baggage of 2020 into 2021. We don't want to carry the feelings and the angst. That's a word, angst. That's a, that's a good word. And all the, the things that troubled us. It, it's, it's a shame to wake up, you know, the next day with the previous day's stuff on your mind. I mean, some things are, are important. I, I know that. But to have the same burden and bad feelings and carry it straight into a new opportunity and season, don't make that mistake. Amen, somebody? Can you praise God today for the word? Praise God at home or wherever you're watching us. Thank God for his word. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I want to email all the members the notes of this message and a link to hear it again. I want us to study it. I want you to get your own insights on it because we need this as a church, as a people of God. We need closure on the, on the issues from last year, uh, maybe unresolved. In a sense, the unresolved, another word, unresolved. Watch out for that, another trap, okay? Because sometimes, <laughs> look at somebody and think, now we got an unresolved thing. No, you got an unresolved thing. Because here's the thing about it. If, if, you, if you have closure, then you're done. Hear me? You're not mad, not angry. You're just done. <laughs> when you're done with something, you're done with it. So if someone bring it up, it's done. I'm, no, I'm not going there. And that's hard sometimes. Because, see, if, if you have closure and someone you know and love doesn't, well, help them get there, first of all. But hear me. Don't let people who lack closure uh, work you, okay? <laughs> Don't let them work you. Because they'll drag you right back to a state where, you, where you're living from. This is tough, tough word here, but there are things you can't get into with people because they got to work things out themselves. They've made you the object, but you're not the object. You're going to wrestle against flesh and blood. And so in this new year, I hope you got stuff squared away last year. We ain't going some places this year. Not going there, all right? Not going there because we're, why? The past doesn't exist. Get a hold of that. The past doesn't exist. Jesus said, if you put your hands on the plow and look back, you're not fit for the kingdom. Now, we do remember. We remember. We don't forget. We remember. That's a covenant word. Remember is a covenant word. But don't look back. Because if you look back, you're going back. And the door that was just open to you is going to close in front of you. And the old door opens back up. And you're going right back where you came from. You don't want that. Say, I don't want that. Father, thank you today for your word. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us of many things here today. I, I doubt if anyone who heard this heard anything new. But, Lord, you've stirred us up in things we know or think we know. Lord, thank you for the fresh perspective. Lord, thank you for revealing to us, Lord God, that, that this is a year of closure and clarity and recovery, or closure, clarity, and covenant as we recover all. And I thank you, Father God, that we'll take this as encouragement and opportunity, Lord, to draw close to you. Lord, not to burden ourselves with any self-imposed mandates, but Lord, just simply to, to give ourselves to you. Lord, as, as we heard from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if we abide in him and his words abide in us, we will ask what we will, what we desire, and it shall be done. And by this, Father, you're glorified that we bear much fruit and we will be your disciples, which are learners. Lord, let us be learners. And Lord, thank you that you've helped us all of last year and that we rejoice. You've saved us, you've kept us. And now, Lord, we expect, Lord, to be able to help others and make a major difference in the lives of others in this year. Lord, thank you that we have closure because we have you. We don't need disclosure. We can settle issues, Lord, 
not because we figure everything out, but because we settle on following you and following your plan. And your plan's enough for whatever we're dealing with. And I thank you, Lord God, that we're going to uh, make that change in this Kairos moment, in this opportunity at the first of this new year. And Lord, we'll make that change because you're the change maker. Lord, nothing here is being done in our own strength. None, none of this, Lord, will work in our own strength. It all works in your strength. It all happens in your presence. And we thank you, Father God, that now as we go into our own times of prayer and reflections and study, that we'll work these issues out with you, Lord God, and emerge from our prayer times encouraged with closure, being settled, Lord God. Even in the midst of difficult circumstances, we have closure so we can go forward. We can close one door, Lord God, so another door can open. Thank you, Lord God, for making it happen for all of us on today and this year. In Jesus' name, amen.